So yeah, then let's continue. Just continue with ES303. We stopped last uh, two weeks ago. We stopped with the composition of the Earth's mantle, and there I told you that the Earth's mantle consists mainly of olivine. It's made up of 67% of olivine. Then you have some autopyroxenes, and you have some glycopyroxenes, and then it depends in which depth you are. Or, um, which rocks you are studying from which depth. So, and therefore, we can subdivide this layer solides in pleasure place layer solides and in uh, spinner layer solides and in garnet layer solides. So, in the upper, um, the upper and lower Earth's mantle has actually a, a theoretical composition, and this theoretical composition is the pyrolite. Samples coming from a depth of about 200, or let us say a maximum of 250 kilometers. Yeah, they are coming up to the Earth's surface via a volcanic eruption or via kimberlite eruption. So, and therefore, Ringwood, this pyrolytic composition, was introduced from Ringwood. So there are some papers around, and there are some books around, and there you can find the theoretical composition, but I will hand out uh, you in class some copies where, uh, where you get uh, some uh, data from these different compositions from the pyrolite, from the chondrite, and from some uh, leosolites, yeah? So, and all these boundaries, you know, from the uh, upper crust, from the lower crust, from the, from the lower crust into the upper mantle, and then into the lower mantle, you know by now these boundaries can be described or uh, can be found by using geophysical methods, yeah? You know this from the ES106, here we have done it, you can maybe check your... your uh, Documents and there you will find the one PowerPoint dealing with, or actually a few PowerPoints. One is dealing with the different boundaries from the Earth's surface to the Earth's core, and the other one is dealing with the geophysical methods. So, and this geophysical These geophysical uh, conditions can be explained by phase transitions.
So when what is a phase? A phase is a mineral. So that means in a certain depth we, are, we can find certain minerals, yeah? So in one very face, very famous face diagrams, because we are talking here then always about face diagrams, that is the face diagram which can be used for the ultra wavy crops. And the ultra mafic rocks are mainly the peridotites, and the peridotites can be subdivided in the neosodites, the arcsodites, and the dunites. So, and for those who have been last year on the Polo excursion, yeah, we will not be able to go to Polo next year or this year because everything is left. So, but maybe we will then visit another island. I mean, in this class, we are still trying to get some uh, these funds. So, and if we are talking about phase diagrams for those who have been in the ES203, then you know these are mostly pressure temperature diagrams because certain minerals are stable under certain pressure conditions. So in the pressure we are using most of the times we are using kilobars, yeah? But some other authors they are using uh, Pascal. So in here as a temperature we are using most of the times degrees Celsius, but Americans for example they are using Kelvin, yeah? So then if you like, or if you are checking a phase diagram, then be always carefully what units they are using, yeah? So and now we need these phase diagrams for the layer solides. We need this phase diagram for the layer solides. At first, we need here some temperatures. Let us say we are starting here with 1,000 degree, moving the unit a little bit below, that we have more space. Then we can have here 1,200, we have 1,400, and here we have 1,600 degrees Celsius. That is the quite hot. So, and here at about 1200 degrees Celsius, here we are making kilobars. At about 1200 degrees Celsius. Up to, let us say, I mean it's only quantitative, here yeah, in the textbook you will then find it uh, more detailed. But here between 1200 and 1400 degrees Celsius, and here we have 20 kilobars, let us say. And then because, and then uh, we have 20 kilobar per plane here, that is more realistic. Then we have here the 10 kilobar. So, and then we can make here a boundary, buffy. And we can make here a boundary roughly. So, and these are boundaries which are pressure dependent. So, around this curve here, we have the solidus. So, that means if we are crossing this boundary here, then we will produce melt. Yeah? Solidus liquidus. So and now we have here a pleasure place, Leasolite, that means we have the mineral Forsterite, that is the olivine, plus CPX, plus OPX, and we have here the pleasure place. So that means we have here a pleasure place, Leasolite, yeah?
So then we make here plus a n. A n that is the armor type and that we know that is the calcium rich plagioclase. So then we have here plagioclase aerosolite. <coughs> then we are increasing the, pre the pressure, let us make it here, 10 kilobars. Then we are increasing the pressure. Then our mineral plagioclase or this armor type becomes unstable. So and that means if the mineral becomes unstable, then it is reacting away. Yeah? Except we are dealing with totally dry conditions. If there is no if there are no volatiles, absolutely zero volatiles, then our anodite can be remain as a metastable mineral or phase at higher temperatures when higher and higher pressures. So you need always a little bit fluid. So but now we are going uh, or we are uh, we are dealing with the classical textbook from Greenwood 1967 and there our anodite is reacting away. Then we have your force right plus CPX plus OPX plus SP. So in the SP stands here for spinel. And not for South Pacific brewery. So then we are talking here about a spinel. Aerosolite. So, and if you remember, while we were in coral, then you could find a lot of spinel aerosolites. Yeah, you remember this? So, that means this spinel aerosolite has been formed at pressures dealing between 10 and 20 kilobars, roughly. So in this you know, without geochemical calculations, you can see it at the end space man, yeah? So what Neil is doing is master on this spinel aerosolite, and therefore we know that in some of this spinel aerosolite, there's still some pleasure place inside. <coughs> but there you need an hand lens or you need a microscope in the thin section. That means this spinel aerosolites from Poro has formed more to lower temperature pressures. Yeah? So, but now we got uh, uh, more funding for doing uh, more uh, excursions and there we can go to South Africa, to the diamond mines and there you can find leosodites formed at pressures of 50 to 60 kilobars, yeah? The distance between 175 and 200 kilometers. So in there you will not find any more spinel aerosolites. There you will find then the garden aerosolite. As then still forsterite plus CPX plus OPX plus garnet. And that is then the garnet aerosolite. Here is out an H. So in the garnet is a mineral which you can also identify very easily. And that is then a reddish mineral, yeah? So and you know the olive is green, the CPX is more dark green. The OPX is brownish. And the garnet is the reddish. 
So then you know that this is a garnet lacerite. So and this lacerite belong all to the peridotite. Family. So in the peridotite family, these are the deasolites. Then you have the artsphodite. And you have the dunite. So in these peridotites can be described in a simple system consists of AL2O3 Then we are using the calcium, the magnesium, and the silica. That is L2O3CAO. MGO. And SiO2. Because all these minerals can be made up by using this um, Components. And these are then actually the mental components. So I mean, in the CP, in the Forster line, the CPX and the OPX, we have also some iron inside. But the iron concentration is very low. So and therefore iron is removed from the rejection or from the projection space. So less than one percent FEO. So and if we have such a pressure diagram, then one kilobar is roughly 3.3 kilometer. So if we are talking about 10 kilobars, then we are talking about 30, a depth of 33 kilometers, roughly. Yeah? It's always like this. P multiplied by the thumb. So and most of the melts, or most magma is a man derived melt. Yeah. So in this man derived melt, they can come from a depth up to 400 kilometer, but most of them may be 120 kilometer, or even more close to the surface. So in all these man derived melts. Showing this composition.
So and one can have different melts. Yeah, one can have uh, when we are talking then about uh, uh, um, about the different magmas. Yeah, we have the, the uh, melt which is formed or comes uh, um, is formed at the middle ocean ridges. Then we have the ocean island basalts. We have the continental flat basalts, and then then. And when we are talking about these different melts, then we are talking then also about dif the dif uh, about the different chemistries and why they are different. Yeah. So that comes then later. So then the next thing is the geotherm, yeah? The geotherm describes a curve at certain pressures and temperatures. And the geotherm usually does not cross-cut here the solids. So that means to produce a melt, we need some other mechanisms, yeah? It is not hot enough in the gross metal to produce a melt. So that means in a certain depth in the Earth's mantle, we have a certain pressure, of course, because the pressure is correlated with the depth, and there we have a certain temperature. So and now we are just putting here inside such a theoretical geotherm, yeah? That means if we are running along this curve, we are going down and down and down, and there we are getting a certain temperature and a certain pressure, yeah? So about the geotherm can always vary. It depends if we are talking about young crust, like it is here, or if you are talking about an old crust, like it is in South Africa, or if you are looking at the subduction zone, when the, when the oceanic crust becomes subduct subducted, between the, um, uh, beneath the continental crust, there we are getting different geotherms, yeah? So if we have a subduction zone, it is more cold, yeah? So whereas if we are talking about ocean island basalts like here, then it is more hot. So and this can be uh, described by the geotherm. So and if the geotherm not cross cutting here the solidus, then we will not just start to melt or produce a melt from these minerals, yeah? So therefore, we need other mechanisms to bring the solutes down to, uh, to our geotherm to produce a melt. So because if this not happens, then nothing will happen, yeah? You get this. We will do it again and again and again, yeah? So that means here the solidus has to be brought down. So that means here the solidus is sitting on this side because here on this side we have the lipidus. So and therefore we need other mechanisms. Geotherm does not cross cut the solidus. Therefore, other mechanisms are necessary. I think it's spent wrong. But anyway, you can correct it by yourself. 
necessary. So in one mechanism is you have fluid, yeah? So that means you have volatiles and these volatiles are a mixture between H2O plus CO2. So and if you have more volatiles, then you can bring down the solutes more close to the, to the geothermal. So, but if your volatiles are more rich in CO2, <coughs> we will all do this also later more in detail, then the temperature goes also down. Generally, the only thing, the CPX and the OPX are stable. Phase transitions Related to AL phases. So that means they are related to minerals which contain aluminium. And these are these three guys, yeah? That is one thing. So and this can be used theoretically or very easily even in the field as a barometer. Yeah? If we have curves like this, then these curves can be used as a barometer because we can precisely estimate the pressure. Yeah? But they are useless at the thermometer. Because if we are running along these two curves, we are dealing with temperatures ranging this and between 800, yeah, let us say here is 800, yeah. Between 800 and 1200 or 1400 degrees Celsius, yeah. So these are not good thermometers. But you can use these curves as a um, A barometer. So and now we are coming to the thermometers because we have still to bring down the solidus to the geotherm for a certain area that we can produce a melt. So and that is actually all what we like to do in vulcanology. We would like to produce a melt and afterwards the big bang. So and now we need some methods to describe <coughs> first to bring down the solidus and methods to can, or methods which can be used to calculate the temperature. So and that cannot be done by just watching the end space event, yeah? But this can be done by petrological methods. So and therefore you can actually do a lot by using a microscope, which we will do that in the practical, yeah? Then you can make some estimations about the temperature. 
But for a precise calculation or estimation of the temperature, you need an electron microprobe. And with an electron microprobe, you can measure the mineral chemical composition of a mineral. So and then you can calculate the temperature. So and how does this now work? That works actually also very easy. No, let us go there. I can remove this here. Yeah? So then let us just start using the pyroxenes, yeah? So these are all binary systems. So if we are talking about binary systems, then it must be again made ring, ring, ring. Because you should remember this from our ES203 class. So a binary system is a system which can be used to describe two components in space. So and let us do this at first for the pyroxenes. Because we have um, in most nerosolites we have um, the clinopyroxene and we have the autopyroxenes, yeah? So whereas if we are talking about hard score guides, then we do have only autopyroxenes, yeah? Because in the hard score guide or the hard score guide can be made up by using the components magnesium, um, silica, and water. Whereas for the neosolites, we have additionally then aluminium and calcium. Yeah? So, and therefore, we are talking now about neosolites because they are more exciting. So, and if we are going back to our class last year, then I make here now a triangle, and if I'm using a triangle, then we are not running longer in a binary system, then we have a ternary system, yeah? Because the triangle has three corners, whereas a binary system is only a line, yeah? You remember this. So then we're making here the CAO, then we are making here the MGO, and on this corner we are making here the FEO. So and this is now our thermometer. So and I'm using now just another color because this blue color is now running away. So then we have, it looks like something, something like this and something like this. If we are looking here, then we have here the dioxide. Yeah? If we are sitting here, then we have here the hidden bulkite. If we are sitting here, then we have here the end star type. So, and if we are sitting here, <coughs> then we have here the ferrocidine. Yes, something like this, but I have drawn it formally something like here. Anyway, because 
a pure ferrocenite is not stable in nature. So and here you have the, the hypersteam. Yep. So that is the hypersteam. I think it should be correct like this. So And here between we have a gap. So that means we cannot have a pyroxene which fall in this field. Yeah? So that means our calcium magnesium exchange is only working uh, in, uh, be between, uh, between uh, here inside our stability field. Yeah? So and here the uh, uh, calcium uh, magnesium exchange is also very limited, yeah? So and if you are measuring if you are measuring a um, pyroxene and you are plotting your composition here in such a triangle and your pyroxene falls inside here, then there are two possibilities. You can have a major paper. All your measurements are just that. So it most of the or probably to 99% second is the case. So how does this now work? I mean we have done this also last year, but we will do it again and again and again. We can write down our end members. And the ferrocyte. So, and I mean, in nature you have much more pyroxenes, but if we are talking about pyroxenes which occur in their solides, then we can describe them by using these four N members. And then you have here the N2 space, the N1 space the tetraedral space, and then for there you have your six oxygen, yeah? You remember this. So and you know the, the, the pure dioxide is calcium on the M2 space. We are always putting the bigger atom on the bigger space. And the M spaces is actually the octahedral spaces. So then we have here the calcium, on the M1 space you have the magnesium, here you have your silica and here you have your 6 oxygen. That is the diopside and the diopside, a pure diopside, plots actually here, yeah? Here you have the, the volastoline. So in such a pure dioxide is formed at the highest temperatures. Yeah? And we call the dioxide Edelbergite uh, load. So now you know where we are doing here only the Fn exchange. All these minerals are doing the Fn exchange. So an Fn exchange that is the iron magnesium exchange, yeah? That is the iron magnesium exchange. And if we are talking about an iron magnesium exchange, what happens? We are going now from our triangle 
back to the binary system, yeah? So in the iron magnesium exchange, it stands for our clinopyroxines, just on this line, yeah? So that is the Fn exchange, and now we can write in here the formula for the hidden bar right, and that is the calcium iron SiO6. Here it's a Si2, and here a 6. So, and that is our iron magnesium exchange. While we are talking for the, 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 about the diopside and the hidden bar diop. Now we are going to these two guys, yeah? Then you know, Mg, Mg, Si206. Then we are sitting exactly here. Yeah? You know to leave it. So anyway, then we are sitting exactly here. Now we are going on this side, along this curve. Again, iron magnesium exchange. We have Fe, Fe, Si2, O6. And then we are sitting here, yeah? So, and that can be used now as a thermometer, yeah? We are running now along this curve here. We can actually do in the practical some exercises. There is a computer program, it is called Will. And um, with Will, you can uh, put in then some mineral chemical analysis from certain minerals made with a microprobe, and then we will calculate the temperature. So, and now you have measured with your microprobe a dioxide, or a, let us say a clinopyroxine and an autopyroxine. Because temperature dependent, you have here the exchange, yeah, magnesium iron, magnesium iron. So, and if this autopyroxine and this clinopyroxine has been formed at high temperatures, then both of them are more magnesium rich. If you are going down with the temperature, then both of them are more iron rich, yeah. So, and then you have to check if they are in equilibrium. So, that means that this autopyroxine and this clinopyroxine has been formed at the same time. So, and if they have been formed at the same time, then they must have, or they must be at the same temperature, and if they form at the same time, then they have formed at the same temperature, yeah? So, I can remove this, yeah? So, because now the next thing comes. So, we are now, we, go, we are going now back to our picture here, because we like to have a new pen. So we are going now back to our melt. So when this melt is formed somewhere in the Earth's melt, yeah? Some other melts coming more close to the Earth's surface, some of them they are rubbing, and some others of them becoming stuck in the Earth's melt. 
So at first, at high temperatures, for example, we are crystallizing here and CPX, yeah? And at the same time, at the same temperature, at the beginning, we are crystallizing here with OPX, yeah? From our melt. So, and then I say these two guys has been formed at 1300 degrees Celsius, yeah? Which is quite very hot. <coughs> Then they are more magnesium rich and maybe they are dying here. Yeah? At high temperatures. So that means the mineral chemical composition at this point, when these two minerals are in equilibrium, then for example our dioxide, I made a shortcut is calcium Mg 0.9, Fe 0.1, yeah? We have 90% magnesium on the M1 space and 10% iron on the M1 space. So when these guys are crystallizing them at higher temperatures, SI206. So, and then we have here the, the hidden bar guide. I make a shortcut HD, calcium, and let us say magnesium. Also, for example, 0 0.9, it is in nature actually not exactly the same. But you should only get an idea how it works, and I think you got it now. So, that means. This, uh, <coughs> it is the other way around, sorry. We have here that 0 0.1 and here we have 0 0.9. So and it is actually the same mineral because you are not crystallizing here too. That is the same mineral. And now uh, we are making here not the dioxide, we are making here the CPX. So because both both of them are CPX. So yeah, and this CPX has a dioxide component of 0 0.9 and the Hindenburgite component of 0 0.1. I think so it is more clear, is it? So but why we are <coughs> Why we are cooling down our melt? Why we are cooling down our melt? Then the mineral can be the composition of these two minerals will also change. Because an autopyroxene and a clinopyroxene, which is formed at lower temperatures, becomes then more and more rich in iron. I make just these two guys here. <coughs> CPX, OPX, then I say these two guys has then form at 900 degrees Celsius, yeah? So we are cooling down the whole thing, yeah? So and if we have such a situation, then our melt must cool down slowly, yeah? Because otherwise, if you have a volcanic eruption and our melt becomes very fast to the earth's surface, and then it, com it, com uh, it comes in contact with water or with air, it will cool down very fast and then you have no, there is no time for mineral chemical exchanges. So that is if you are melt formed in the mantle and becomes stuck somewhere. But also, <coughs> while you are, or when you are forming the melt, 
at lower rate degrees, yeah? So then you are forming a rate at lower temperatures, and therefore you are more than you are. Um, Autophyroxine and your thyrophyroxine is more rich in iron, yeah? So, and that's the way how the temperature is directly or can be directly correlated with the mineral chemical composition. So, we are sitting here now at 900 degrees Celsius. We have in this guys, let us at first finish here. <coughs> the OPX is then also more rich in in magnesium, let us say 0 0.8 and 0 0.2 iron, SI206. So why we are going now here? I'm just connecting this one with this bracket here, yeah? Then you follow. So then we have, a, that is then at 1300 degrees Celsius, for example. So in this one is then, for example, at 900 degrees Celsius, yeah? Then you have here a CPX and an OPX. Let us say magnesium 0.3 and iron 0.7, SI206 and the OPX is the maybe magnesium 0.2, iron 0.8, SI2. Six, for example, yeah. So, and that is now for the pyroxenes, yeah. So, and there you can have a calculate precisely the temperature. So, so and now we are going back. Now for the pyroxenes. So, but I told you before we can subdivide this uh, leosolite in the plagiarized leosolite, the spinel leosolite, and the garment leosolite. And of course, you have also the olivine inside. And with the olivines, the thing is. There are two end members, the forster right. And you have the fire light. And the forster right that is MG2 SiO4. And the fire light is Fe2 SiO4. <coughs> Then you have here again the FM exchange. 
some of the beads are forced to write from that higher temperatures is more magnesium rich and the forced to write at lower temperatures or the olivine which is formed at lower temperatures is more rich in iron. So and then you can measure this as well and then you can do the pile, then you can put to your calculations with the two pyroxides, you can then also put for olivine. Yeah? So but now we have the next mineral. And there we are going now to the plateau place. <coughs> I told you before or, the, or at the beginning of this class that we have these anorthite aerosolites, yeah? These are the guys for the lower temperatures. So in such a plateau place is doing the sodium calcium exchange. And you remember from former times this made bananas. So, and here we have the albite, and here we have the anorthite. That means here we have an NaAlSi3O8, and here we have the calcium Al2Si2O8. And between here we have a mixture. So and on this side we have melt, here it is solid, and here within the banana we have solid plus melt. So and here it is more acid, and here it is more maybe. So and if we are starting here or here we are, if we have a pure <coughs> anorthite, and we are sitting here about 1550 degrees Celsius, and here if we have a pure amor albite, then we are sitting here at 1110 degrees Celsius. Yeah? So and if we have then here this uh, a certain melt. composition of the melt, then we are cooling down till we are reaching here the solidus curve. Then we are going to the, 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 the libidus, then we are going down to the solidus curve, and then we are getting finally And pledge your place with this, uh, uh, this composition. So it starts to grow at this temperature here. Yeah? Then it is cooling down to this temperature here. Here we have the delta T. So at that means. That is then here the ex albite or ex amortite, and the ex amortite is uh, 
Anota x, anota y de is. Anota y component divided by anota y plus alba y component. So, so if there, oh, let's not do it sentence. Then equilibrium will be between the crystal or the magic phase and Control it by diffusion. So that means you are growing here or crystallizing, you are starting at higher temperatures to crystallize a pleasure place with a higher calcium concentration. And while you are cooling down, your pleasure place becomes more rich in sodium. So in this calcium sodium exchange is controlled by the fusion. So but if you have such a situation, Where our man is cooling down more slowly, that man means our man becomes stuck somewhere. Yeah? It is not a button somewhere on the worst surface, because otherwise, otherwise, it will cool down fast. Yeah? So, and now, but now our man here is erupting at the worst surface. Somewhere here, just behind this house here, yeah? So then we have to think about what happens then. So because if our bed becomes cooled down very fast, then there is no time for diffusion processes, yeah? Because the whole thing becomes then frozen immediately, yeah? If the melt or magma cools down fast, then summation can be observed at the legit place with the
So and this can be seen in thin section. So that means we have here a plateau phase crystal. So then the, the, the core is then very rich in calcium. <coughs> and the rim is then rich in sodium. So because it's cool, it cools down very fast, so and then you are making here a, a strong sonation, yeah? So that is because there is no time for any diffusion. So if our crystal cools down very slowly, then you will not scale, then you will not observe in this section any sonation because of the slow diffusion. So I can remove this, yeah? So and now we have such a melt and we are crystallizing our minerals yeah, and then we find we are cooling down our melt then our hydroxines um, becoming always more rich in um, iron and our plastic phase becomes the more rich in sodium so and I have written just on the board that um, this um, Albite is a more acid, whereas the amortite is more wavy. Yeah? So and, uh, if we are checking here just the mineral chemical formulas, then we can observe that the albite has three silica and the amortite has two silicas. Yeah? So and now I will give you some uh, values. Average composition of. So and then we have here the crust. And here we have the mantle. So the mantle rocks are more wavy, and the earth's crust is more acid, yeah? Or we are saying also more felsic, yeah? So and I told you that before the cyclone came here, yeah, I, I hope that the cyclone has not blown out everything. But there I told you at the beginning when this planet was formed, yeah, 4,540 million years ago. Then the Earth 
as an average composition. Yeah, that is actually the chemical composition from the homogeneous earth. <coughs> From the homogeneous earths. So, and there we are, I told you, there we had the magma ocean here, yeah, that was the ideal magma ocean, you remember, yeah. Everything was the same. It is chemically comparable as the, at the conditions of the Venus today, and we know Venus is the sister planet of the Earth. So, but then we had formed. A little bit later, let us say at 3,600 million years ago, the first crust has been formed, yeah? And that was the first continent, and the first continent that was Valbara, and formed all the remnants of Valbara can be found in South Africa today, that is in the Kapal. And in Western Australia, there is the Pipara. And there we have also the proof meant that the land masses <coughs> of these two continents or fragments has been together during Alpine eras. And that was between 3,600 and 2,800 million years ago. So in the, the big collision event, that was three thousand three hundred million years ago. And that was the time when the greenstone belt in South Africa was formed that is today the power. So, but anyway, we have formed from our magma ocean first continental crust, yeah? So, and that happened because the magma ocean was going to cool down, yeah? So, I mean, um, 200 or 300 million years after the planet was formed, we formed and also Yeah, first oxygen, yeah? Yeah, yeah, that is true. Maybe I should give uh, for this a class of the Earth's history, yeah? Because it is important to understand this mechanism, but now we are going back here. So we have here an average composition of the, S, uh, of the crust. Has a certain composition of SiO2. We are just using this very simple system, FEO and MGO. <coughs> so in the crust has an average composition of 58.3%, whereas the mantle has an average composition of 45.1%. So then we are looking at the aluminium concentration. The crust has 15.3 weight percent aluminium. Whereas the mantle has only 4.6. Then the iron concentration here from the crust is 4.85. 4 4. The mantle is more rich as 7.6. And then the magnesium concentration of the crust is 4.17 so in those of the mantle, the mantle is much more rich in magnesium thirty 
point eight one person. Thirty eight point one. Yeah. These are just some average values. You can see that the crust is more rich in magnesium and silica, more rich in aluminium, and the mantle is more rich in magnesium. Yeah. So and why is this now? This is due to our differentiation processes. Yeah. So, for example, at first, or at high temperatures, we are crystallizing an olivine, yeah? For the olivines, you can also make such a banana diagram. Here we have 1890 degrees Celsius, and there we have about 1200. So, if the values are not totally the same as in the textbook, then sorry because I um, have only roughly the values in my head. There we have the fire light, that is the iron rich olivine. Forsterite and we have the X Forsterite is Forsterite divided by Forsterite. That's firelight. So and you know that this olivines, the Forsterite is NG2 Si04. <coughs> So in here we have the Fe2 SiO4. So that means while we are crystallizing olivine, then we are removing always two moles of magnesium, but only one mole or one unit of silica. Yeah? So that means the olivine is a metal mineral. So in the fact that we are always removing more magnesium, it is two to one the ratio, yeah? And the olivine is a mineral of the earth's mantle and of the oceanic crust, yeah? Then we are sucking always out all the magnesium. And those rocks which are formed at higher temperatures are more rich in magnesium and more rich in, I mean, um, how is it called? More rich in magnesium and in iron, yeah? So, and therefore, our first mantle is more rich in magnesium, yeah? So, because in granitic rocks, <coughs> you will not find any olivines, yeah? So, and if you are going back to our other diagram, which you have drawn uh, maybe an hour ago about the pyroxenes, yeah? And checking the other mineral chemical formulas, then you are removing always one magnesium and one silica. So, that is 50-50, yeah? Can you just do this and do it? The one one ratio between the pyroxenes and the silica. No. So, and therefore, you have other minerals in the Earth's mantle and in the oceanic crust compared to the continental crust. Now, going back to this banana. So we have the albite, and the albite has three silica. And here the anorthite has only two. So that means the anorthite is more vague. 
So the lag of light is formed in either higher temperatures according to my diagram here. And the albright is formed at lower temperatures. And there is more silica. So, and the albright that is those plagioclase which is situated in the continental crust. And indeed, the continental crust is more silica rich. So and if you are going back to our diagram here, then we have a certain melt here, we are going there to the SL curve, that is the solidus liquidus curve, we are going back here and here, and then we are going down. So, and that is then our peridotite. While we are cooling down our melt, let us say from here, and our melt is then always changing the chemical composition, yeah? Because we are removing always more and more magnesium. So, and by removing more and more magnesium, our well becomes then always more and more rich in what? Iron. So that we are going here, here, here. So, in this composition here, that uh, this is an olivine which you will not find in the peridotite, yeah? So that is an olivine which you will be maybe find in, the, in some basalts, yeah? So and that is the, here the SL lens that means solidus liquidus And this here is our typical mental olivine, which you will find in the peridotite. And I told you, peridotites can be subdivided can be subdivided in the two light, the hard scogite and the near scogite.
So then we are actually done for today. I think one and a half hours is now. At least one minute.